Hey, welcome back to the channel. My name is Steve Lund, and in this video, I'm going to talk about how can you get more deep sleep. So basically, I'm going to be giving you almost like a mini podcast um, about like a full guide to getting more deep sleep. So you can sleep better, get more recovery, and just be healthier. This episode is brought to you by the world's most recognized probiotic supplement, Seed. Seed's Daily Symbiotic is a pre- and probiotic 2-in-1 capsule that supports your gut health, skin, digestion, and so much more. Seed isn't a cocktail of random strains of bacteria that do nothing. It contains 24 clinically and scientifically studied strains, which makes Seed the first of its kind. Seed's Daily Symbiotic is the only probiotic supplement I'm taking regularly because of how much it's backed by research. I noticed the benefits it has on my digestion and overall energy. You can get a 15% discount of Seed's Daily Symbiotic by using the code SEAM15 at seed.com forward slash SEAM15. That's S-I-I-M 15 at seed.com forward slash SEAM15. So to actually know how much deep sleep you're getting, you know, you would need some sort of a tracker, you know, and uh, I use the O-Ring using that for many years and I do get a good, good consistent amount of high deep sleep all the, all the time on a regular basis so these are kind of my average nights so i get usually like two hours of deep sleep i may not get that much rem all the time <laughs> but uh, i do get uh, adequate deep sleep on a regular basis and some you know my records are three hours even like up to 50 percent of my sleep totally uh, may have been some deep sleep sometimes uh, but i think that can be like a misreading from the aura itself that actually a part of that is going to be rem sleep but you know regardless i get plenty of uh, deep sleep and i get high amounts of deep sleep as well and, you know, what is deep sleep? Deep sleep is uh, quite a crucial part of the entire healthy sleep cycle. And uh, you need deep sleep for many things, mostly for physical repair. You need to, to be in deep sleep to conduct all these different kinds of repair processes, especially related to like muscle repair, uh, you know, just overall health in related, relation to your body. Uh, the REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, is a time where your brain is, you know, doing a lot of most of the processing and that's where you also see dreams so one sleep cycle lasts about an hour and a half and it starts from you know wakefulness goes into n n1 nrem1 stage nrem2 and nrem3 is uh, considered the deep sleep stage after which you go into rapidly to near wakefulness where you go into rem sleep and you see dreams and during time you during the entire night you uh, get about uh, four or five total sleep cycles in total if you sleep somewhere between so like seven hours and uh, Yeah, the majority of deep sleep occurs in the first half of uh, the night like between 11 p.m. until 2 to 3 uh, a.m. is where you get mostly uh, deep sleep and then in the dawn basically in the later part of the night or early morning dawn uh, that is where you get uh, more uh, REM sleep and more dreams so uh, that's why the body kind of prioritizes the physical repair first and then it starts to repair the brain and the neurological processes. Uh, so yeah, deep sleep is quite crucial in many aspects. Uh, how much deep sleep should you get? Uh, this, you know, this depends a lot on your uh, overall health, some genetics, and uh, when do you go to sleep, how much you sleep in total, etc. Uh, on average, it's uh, okay or it's healthy to be awake for about 2 to 5% of the night. Uh, light sleep contributes the vast majority of your uh, sleep. The NREM2 and NREM1 stages, you get like 40 to 50% of it can be up to uh, light sleep. Although, like, ideal, you would want to have like a little less of that or you can compress it. Deep sleep, 13 to 23%. I would uh, much rather have like 25 or 30% as deep sleep because it's still quite... Uh, crucial you don't want to be having too much light sleep or you know you don't want to be deficient in light sleep but compared to deep sleep then um, or compared to yeah, like light sleep deep sleep is much more important and REM sleep somewhere between 20 to 25 percent is a healthy amount uh, too much REM can make you like schizophrenic <laughs> or something like that it can cause like some it can also reflect some other uh, problems uh, with the brain uh, if you get too much REM sleep uh, but yeah deep sleep I would much rather have like a 30 percent uh, deep sleep so let's begin with how do you actually get more deep sleep? Many people do struggle with that. They struggle with uh, energy levels. They struggle with motivation. They struggle with uh, staying asleep. They struggle with, you know, body aches and pains. And they get memory loss, etc. And that can all be tied to it back to like just the poor quality sleep. And uh, deep sleep especially will, will relate to things like, yeah, like physical side, like uh, injuries and 
uh, physical soreness and those kind of things. So what is the number one thing that I think is the most important thing for overall sleep architecture? architecture uh, that's going to be uh, the circadian rhythms. So uh, the circadian rhythms, if you don't know, then they are these day and night cycles, uh, diurnal rhythms inside the body that control basically everything um, that's going on, including the sleep hormones and inclu including all the sleep stages. And the main circadian rhythm uh, but probably related to just wakefulness and sleep is the melatonin and cortisol circadian rhythm. And uh, they follow this uh, inverse pattern almost, uh, or reflecting, re they reflect each other, or um, they're not you know, similar. So cortisol tends to be the stress hormone, the wakefulness boosting hormone. It rises in the morning, peaks at 9 a.m. and drops low uh, for the rest of the day. And it stays low for the, throughout the night as well. Whereas uh, melatonin, um, melatonin is low in the morning and more low during daytime but it starts to rise at 9 p.m and peaks at like the middle of the night and then also starts to gradually decrease but it's still very elevated and it drops down after the cortisol begins to rise so this is the you know melatonin is the sleep hormone or the hormone of darkness that uh, basically starts the repair processes melatonin is linked to all these uh, different kinds of antioxidant defense systems in the body autophagy growth hormone uh, cholesterol synthesis, gluconeogenesis, uh, detoxifying the brain, bone health. Yeah, like, I mean, the melatonin is not only like a sleep hormone, it's a longevity hormone. Uh, you don't want to be low in melatonin by any means. And uh, that can be quite <laughs> damaging to your overall health, especially when it comes to sleep quality. And uh, yeah, with an optimal functioning circadian rhythm, then your body should have like these uh, cycles mapped out quite easily that you should produce high amounts of cortisol in the morning it's healthy to have high amounts of cortisol after you wake up and peak at 9 a.m etc and then drop down and it's healthy for your body to have a lot of melatonin when you go to bed and when you fall asleep because it needs the melatonin to conduct the repair processes and the circadian rhythms are regulated by many things um, the biggest trigger is going to be light light and darkness cues uh, that are mediated through the eyes so uh, wavelengths from any kind of source, uh, light wavelengths will enter the eyes through the retina, they will enter the brain and stimulate the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is the uh, master circadian clock inside the brain. And that master circadian clock regulates all the peripheral clocks, like in the heart, liver, muscle, kidney, pancreas, uh, fat cells, even the gut, they all have their circadian clocks. And that is regulated by the master clock inside the brain. And the master clock is like the major, major, vast majority of it is regulated by the day and night cycles and the uh, light cues that you get through the eyes. So the eyes are the most uh, biggest, let's say, channel for the circadian rhythms. Other things that also affect it are like eating, feeding times and physical activity. There's also temperature that uh, contributes to that. But they target mostly like the peripheral clocks, so uh, food will mostly target like the gut and uh, the microbiome and the fat cells and those kind of things. Uh, but those uh, peripheral clocks will then send signals back to the master clock as well that will then regulate the sleep on the cycle, uh, your uh, cognitive performance, your physical performance and uh, hormone production. So yeah, the clocks are always the clocks are always running, as I like to say, and your, whether or not your body is in sync with the uh, clocks depends on the cues that you get. And if you are in sync with the cues and with the clocks, then um, your body will be also healthier and it will produce the right hormones at the right time that will allow you to fall asleep, etc. If there is some sort of a mismatch, uh, you're getting the light, si light signals at the wrong times, you're getting the feeding signals at the wrong times, uh, whatever it may be, you're jet lagged, uh, then uh, or shift work, then the clocks will be out of sync and then they actually begin to be get, become damaged, they become to work disorderly and out of sync, which will then cause like sleeping problems and uh, bad, let's say, health overall. Light itself, you know, shouldn't be thought of as just, you know, light. It's actually, yeah, you can think of it as nutrition or a very important aspect of uh, overall health uh, because the light, the circadian rhythms through the suprachiasmatic nucleus, they uh, regulate, yeah, DNA repair, methylation, NAD plus recycling, autophagy, detox pathways, digestion, insulin sensitivity, fat burning, growth hormone, all those things are linked to the circadian uh, signals. And especially when it comes to deep sleep and sleep, then yeah, obviously melatonin, melatonin production is linked to the light signals. Your body doesn't produce melatonin at morning and uh, daytime, but it does, or it's supposed to produce it uh, before you go to bed. And uh, that's, where it, that's where you need it the most. So on a natural setting, in a natural environment, 
the uh, daily circadian rhythm would look like this, that in the noon time or morning you get like this full spectrum um, sunlight that uh, consists of all the uh, solar spectrum, all the uh, violet colors or the rainbow colors and uh, it comes almost you know like a very balanced way so you get blue light you get green light but you also get red light etc from the uh, daytime sunlight and that's very healthy it keeps the circadian clocks running it helps your body prepares your body to produce melatonin at night etc and in the evening uh, it uh, shifts more towards like this uh, amber lights more red more orangish and much less of the blue violet and green lights uh, because the sun is setting and the wavelengths become you know more tilted towards this higher um, frequencies or nanometers uh, in the evening or at night completely when the sun is set then uh, that where you should get mostly only like you know red light naturally uh, there weren't no smartphones there weren't no like uh, lamps in uh, the hunter-gatherer times so uh, even you know, like a few hundred years ago there was no artificial light so people were able to get to this high amount of red light at night as well as their only source of light which is you know relatively healthy it doesn't disrupt the circadian rhythms and it's uh, devoid of this artificial light that would be damaging to your health because the blue light the artificial light it uh, inhibits melatonin production so the blue light green light turquoise uh, violet they tend to inhibit melatonin production which will then lower your melatonin levels um, makes you fall asleep worse or decreases the time it takes to fall asleep reduces all overall sleep quality and uh, makes it harder to kind of stay asleep uh, you definitely produce less melatonin which is you know unhealthy whereas the uh, red lights sunsets uh, campfire candlelight as well as like red light bulbs red light therapy devices they don't inhibit melatonin because they have these uh, wavelengths between 700 to 600 650 or 550 uh, nanometers those uh, yellow amber red lights don't inhibit melatonin so this is the light that you want to get exposed to uh, prior to before going to bed as opposed to this blue light and obviously in the modern world we're so surrounded by these blue lights all the time and uh, the smartphone the computer screen even like the blinking light on the smoke detector <laughs> that can also have this uh, green or uh, blue light interfering with your uh, melatonin production uh, even just a small amount can be enough to uh, suppress the melatonin and it takes at least like 30 minutes to 45 minutes for your body to resume the melatonin production because what it essentially signals the brain is that you know it's daytime it's not time to go to sleep and you should you know just go hunt or stay active to gather resources instead of uh, sleeping uh, whereas in reality you may actually need to get recovery and sleep which would require the red lights and absence of um, blue light you would still want to sleep in complete darkness like in zero light <laughs> but uh, before bed you would want to get exposed to some sort of like red lights as opposed to uh, blue lights and uh, the LED lights also uh, that you can expose that you get exposed to during the daytime those are also problematic because uh, they come in just like imbalanced uh, frequencies or the wavelength that you get from them is like slightly imbalanced compared to the solar spectrum the solar spectrum has all the uh, wavelengths that are kind of relatively balanced uh, but with uh, the LED lights artificial lights you get this high amount of uh, blue light and high amount of green light and not enough of the red light that has these anti-inflammatory properties so you get you know more oxidative stress you damage your eyes with the artificial light uh, much more compared to the sunlight and you don't get the proper circadian signaling as well from the uh, led lights and that's why using um, some sort of blue blocking glasses i think is the, one of the best sleep hacks so i think the number one sleep hack probably it's better than it's better than um taking melatonin is better than um, you know using any sort of fancy gadgets it's better than uh, using even a sleep tracker so uh, yeah the blue bucket glasses are I think one of the best things you can do to just protect your sleep especially if you tend to have like some lights in your uh, room bedroom or you tend to uh, stay up too, la too late watching at your smartphone so the blue blocking glasses will filter out the specific uh, blue and green light that will inhibit melatonin but they will uh, let through only the red and amber uh, wavelengths so uh, this company that i'm working with is blue box and uh, they have very stylish glasses the red lenses they have been tested so uh, these spectrogram on, on the blue box as you can see it filters out all the uh, blue and green and it leaves only the uh, amber red lights which uh, are the ones that don't inhibit melatonin so this is what you want um, to know whether or not your blue blocking glasses work you have to you know, obviously if 
if the company has their spectrogram analysis test results on their website then that's the best thing because you can see hey it's actually legit uh, most like many as even like some reputable brands that you get from amazon or whatever they say that it's you know blue blocking glasses but they don't even you know filter out the blue light or they leave some of the green light in uh, which is not ideal you want to block out all the blue and the green light and to know whether or not your glasses work you can just you know put them on and look at this rgb circles uh, so uh, if you can see the blue light then obviously or if you can see the green light then um, it means they're not working you should see only the red circle uh, the blue circle should be completely black and the green light may green circle may be like slightly grayish or slightly darker but it shouldn't be gray or it shouldn't be green uh, you, sh you shouldn't see green or blue colors when you're using uh, your blue blocking glasses you should only see slightly like this yellow maybe amber and uh, red colors moving on with uh, melatonin more like how do you make melatonin uh, your body can make it from different precursors uh, the biggest trip uh, precursor is a uh, tryptophan which is an amino acid that you get from uh, protein primarily uh, tryptophan gets converted into 5-HTP that requires folate and vitamin C for example it also requires iron for that 5-HTP uh, gets converted into serotonin this conversion requires vitamin B6 and zinc and serotonin then con converted into melatonin the end product and this conversion also requires vitamin B6 and zinc so you, do, you don't basically want to be eating protein uh, to help your body to produce melatonin as well as many other neurotransmitters and you need basically a good uh, whole foods diet for this uh, to happen uh, so some problem can also sometimes for a lot of people be that although they're eating tryptophan then they're still not able to fall asleep or they're slightly anxious um, that has to do with the tryptophan not really reaching the brain because there's a, like many other amino acids in the, in the bloodstream let's say if you eat a piece of chicken that generally has high amounts of tryptophan if you eat that then a lot of that, all, all those amino acids that you get from the chicken may not reach the brain uh, because there's like competing amino acids. Uh, if there's a lot of competing amino acids, then tryptophan won't get there. And uh, that's where like eating some carbs actually can help by uh, raising insulin. You eat carbs, the insulin shuttles the other competing amino acids into the cells away from uh, tryptophan basically. And that there's, then there's more tryptophan that will be able to enter the brain and get converted into serotonin and then into melatonin so yeah only eating tryptophan only eating protein may not always work um, and this is where carbs actually are good uh, food uh, for the evening uh, because you're going to experience this serotonin crash basically uh, that uh, helps you to produce melatonin and uh, kind of fall asleep a bit easier some specific foods also have melatonin directly um, and uh, those foods tend to be the ones that are exposed to a lot of like uh, sunlight and uh, they accumulate this melatonin in, in their like skins primarily and uh, all these dark fruit that are in the sun like dark cherries are the highest melatonin uh, foods like dark cherry uh, tart juice uh, is a good source of melatonin leafy vegetables berries um, tart cherry juice um, and uh, milk is also the milk how much melatonin milk has depends on uh, how much sunlight the uh, animal was exposed to and also when you milk it so if you milk the cows during daytime then they produce much less melatonin and the milk also has less melatonin whereas if you milk the cows in the evening then uh, that milk also has a bit more melatonin because you know that's where the cows would also naturally produce some uh, melatonin uh, food let's continue on with food and the circadian rhythms um, you know, I said light and darkness are the main uh, regulators of the master clock, which is true. But food and calories will primarily affect the peripheral clocks in the intestines and the gut, which will then send a signal to the master clock. And based upon that information, the master clock will control all the sleep wake cycles and uh, things of that digestion and uh, hormone production. And there are some studies that even suggest that the uh, food intake may be uh, like a bigger controller of the master clock in some cases like if you eat in the middle of the night then obviously the food intake will shift the peripheral clocks or misalign them and that will also misalign the master clock in some way uh, so you don't want to be eating like at night basically you want to be eating during the activity period for humans which is you know during daytime uh, this is where the time restricted eating uh, com concept uh, comes into play it's also linked to the circadian rhythms it's uh, quite well researched uh, by now that it does have some positive effects on sleep quality and uh, overall health 
the average person tends to eat like within a 16 hour window and fasts only eight hours so they eat from the moment they wake up until the moment they go to bed so they never experience this fast state and they are misaligning the circadian rhythms to a certain extent by just being in this fast state constantly and suppressing uh, or mis causing uh, misalignments with the master clock then there is the concept of intermittent fasting or time restricted eating is the more um, scientific term and this is slightly different that you actually fast for 16 hours and you eat within eight hours uh, there's different ways of doing it like you know you can eat early in the day you can eat later in the day it doesn't matter i think uh, as long as you don't eat immediately before bed um, it shouldn't be a problem for your sleep quality uh, you should want to have at least a few hours uh, where you stop eating before going to bed to allow the body to digest and to not like eat a massive meal before uh, there are the circadian clocks of uh, food intake or you know the based upon what the circadian clocks do to your uh, metabolism uh, ideally you should want to eat you know when your body is the most insulin sensitive and metabolically flexible which tends to be in the a.m. part or uh, the earlier day uh, somewhere between 10 a.m. until 12 is where you have the highest insulin sensitivity but uh, also your physical performance tends to be better in the afternoon like 2 to 5 p.m. and if you eat then then you're still very insulin sensitive after a workout that's that's you know because of the uh, Physical exercise activates all these GLUT4 receptors, makes you very insulin sensitive. And uh, even then, if your natural insulin sensitivity would be lower because of the circadian rhythms, you would still be very insulin sensitive in the afternoon or evening if you worked out before. Uh, so it's a very safe kind of window to eat anywhere between like you know 10 a.m. until 6 p.m. somewhere there, 7 p.m. Um, I wouldn't eat like immediately after waking up because the cortisol is rising. Uh, you don't want to blunt it. You don't want to overexpress it. Um, I would let the cortisol do its job first thing in the morning and it peaks at like 9 a.m. And after that, it begins to decrease. Melatonin production naturally would begin like around 9 p.m., 10 p.m., somewhere around there. And what melatonin does is actually makes your body a bit more insulin resistant. So it binds to pancreatic cells and prevents the insulin production and uh, that's where you don't want to be eating especially the carbs because your body wouldn't have enough insulin to clear the bloodstream from the glucose and that, that can cause like high, high blood sugar levels so uh, ideally you should also want to stop eating before 9 p.m uh, that's when the uh, melatonin production should uh, begin and growth hormone uh, this is the kind of mostly repair hormone not like a muscle building hormone but that starts to rise 11 p.m. and stays elevated until 2 p.m. So you would want to be in a semi, like, you know, not with a full stomach uh, when this process uh, happens. The microbiome, uh, the microbiome also has some effects on the uh, master clocks and circadian rhythms. So actually 70% of the serotonin production of your body comes from the gut and uh, serotonin then gets converted into melatonin. Uh, so yeah, your circadian rhythms can shift your microbiome they can cause like bad strains of bacteria to overpopulate and they can kill off uh, the beneficial ones and at the same time like just a poor working microbiome can or let's say food intake at the wrong time can also dysregulate the circadian master clock so it's quite um, let's say important <laughs> to uh, have some sort of time machine eating at least to a certain extent like i wouldn't say that you need to do like a 16 hour fast or one meal a day uh, I would say like at least 12 hours and 12 hours of fasting, 12 hours of eating, uh, that should be like a gold standard for everyone. And um, ideally, you should want to confine it a little bit more, like 14 hours fasted or something like that. What are some supplements for deep sleep, especially here are ones that I tend to take. Uh, melatonin, uh, melatonin, um, you know, it's it's still some somewhat beneficial to take some melatonin every once in a while as well because of the longevity boosting benefits that you get um, in small doses it doesn't have any negative side effects it's not going to suppress your natural melatonin production in larger doses like 75 milligrams it can be a contraceptive but if you only take 0 0.3 or 1 milligram then uh, it's not going to ha have those effects and um, it's not going to also disrupt the circadian rhythm it has immunity boosting benefits like melatonin supplementation has also been used to treat you know the pandemic or the cases of the pandemic uh, the virus to a certain extent and uh, yeah like a small dose 0.3 milligrams up to one milligram 
that can actually give like a small boost in just the melatonin production and uh, essentially it's very beneficial if you have like had bad sleep or if you have short sleep or if you have jet lag then you can use the melatonin supplement to reset your circadian rhythm or uh, align it much beneficially magnesium um, you know very important mineral a lot of people are deficient 500 milligrams tends to be like a good rda for most people and uh, you know, if you take 500 milligrams of magnesium before bed, then you just feel very relaxed and uh, calm and it helps you to fall asleep. Uh, reishi mushroom is something that I use uh, quite frequently. It uh, actually helps also with sleep architecture, lengthens overall sleep, uh, makes you have crazy dreams or you get a lot more dreams with reishi, which uh, I do get myself as well. I take usually like 400 milligrams uh, and uh, I don't take it all the time, but yet, Quite frequently, I take it, and I do get very vivid and very like rememberable dreams if I uh, implement that. Glycine, two grams, two to three, even five grams is fine. Like glycine is an inhibitory amino acid. It uh, lowers your body temperature, relaxes you, boosts good glutathione and antioxidants. Um, yeah, it's a longevity supplement, but it also helps with sleep. I like it; makes you relaxed and calm. Uh, taurine. Is also an inhibitory uh, amino acid. Two grams can be beneficial. Theanine, uh, generally like a relaxing amino acid, 200 milligrams. You can take it even during daytime with coffee to kind of ease out of the uh, jitters of coffee or something. Uh, or if you're stressed out, then L-theanine can be a great one. Essential amino acids, you know, for getting these amino acids that are required for producing all these neurotransmitters. Um, you don't need to take it uh, before bed, but even during daytime, some essential amino acids, 10 to 15 grams, can be uh, beneficial. And lastly, like a seed, uh, daily symbiotic is what I take. It's uh, also, uh, uh, you know, obviously with a link to the gut microbiome. If your uh, gut microbiome is messed up or it has an overgrowth of uh, too many bad bacteria and not enough good ones, um, then... Um, it's going to be a negative effect on the circadian clock system. So some sort of a probiotic supplement is general improves motility and just well-being and things like that as well. Let's talk about caffeine. You know, caffeine stays in your system for quite a long time. Uh, the half-life of caffeine is like five to six hours. So, you know, 50% of it is still going to be in your system after six hours of drinking. So, uh, yeah, like even within 24 hours of drinking a full cup of coffee, there's going to be some amounts of caffeine in your system. So that's why, you know, you obviously don't want to be overdoing the caffeine. Uh, I generally drink like one to two cups of coffee a day, maybe three at max. And uh, I don't have any negative side effects from that. I get still plenty of good sleep. Uh, the problem is that you, you know, when you take it matters, I try to cut off caffeine uh, at noon so that I would have like a long period of time, at least, you know, 50% more than that will be out of my system uh, before the evening. Let's talk about the aspect of aging the problem with aging with the circadian rhythms uh, when you do get older then your uh, circadian rhythm system becomes more damaged because of you know aging aging causes oxidative stress aging uh, reduces the let's say effectiveness of the retina to transmit the signals to the circadian clock system your brain gets you know slightly damaged uh, with age and that's when you produce less of these hormones you produce less melatonin you produce less cortisol you produce less growth hormone, all these hormones get damaged partly because of the aging, damaging the circadian clock system. And this will, has been shown to like, all the people get significantly less total sleep and their sleep quality is worse, uh, their deep sleep is worse. <laughs> so that's because of the circadian rhythms become more flat. You want to have like these big swings. It's healthy to have a high amount of cortisol and high amount of melatonin and low amount of cortisol at night. And, uh, but with age, it becomes very flat. You don't produce that much cortisol, so you wake up with less energy. You don't kickstart the circadian system uh, that easily, and you produce less melatonin as well, which will uh, make you not sleep that well. Uh, fortunately, it has been found that this process of, let's say, damaging of the circadian clock system has been found to be able to be reversed with things like calorie restriction. So calorie restriction improves NAD metabolism NAD is involved with the circadian clock system. It repairs, it, it uh, has DNA repair effects and epigenetic effects of anti-aging uh, longevity effects. So it repairs the circadian clock system back into a more youthful state, basically, so that you would be still able to produce more melatonin and uh, produce those hormones that are required. And there are many things that you know, have this effect with NAD, like 
calorie restriction is one of them intermittent fasting does it or time restricted eating does it uh, time restricted eating actually directly activates one of the uh, recycling pathways of NAD that uh, increases your NAD levels NAD supplements or NAD boosters can be an effective way to raise your NAD levels especially if you take it in the morning exercise does it and uh, just being aligned with the circadian uh, rhythms also keeps your NAD pathways aligned and uh, synchronized uh, which means they're yeah, just getting daylight and sunlight exposure and sleeping at the right time. Things that derail the circadian clock system or damage them, make them break apart, are shift work, circadian disruption, chronic inflammation, jet lag, and everything related to the uh, yeah, misalignment of the circadian rhythms. Next up, let's talk about EMF. You know, the blue light that you get from a smartphone is bad for the melatonin production, but the EMF uh, can all, has also been found to have a negative effect on sleep quality. And uh, there is a positive association with uh, EMF exposure and uh, sleep quality. So what you can do for that is, you know, obviously turn off the Wi-Fi if you can, turn off all the electronics in your house, put your uh, phone on airplane mode, and you can also do some grounding, uh, which has been shown to, in studies, lower inflammation, improve sleep quality, reduce pain, uh, reduce blood pressure, improve mood, reduce blood viscosity, reduce oxidative stress, etc. Uh, so it's a very... Um, quick and free way of uh, doing that, of uh, just lowering your body's EMF, let's say, build-up uh, that uh, can improve your sleep, especially if you do it in the evening before bed. Next, we'll talk about temperature. So temperature is also with a circadian rhythm. Your body's uh, temperature while you're sleeping is the lowest. So the lowest dump or the um, throw, what you call it, uh, is uh, around like 4 a.m., 5 a.m. is where your body has the lowest temperature. And the highest temperature is uh, like 6 p.m. And the highest blood pressure is also around that time. Um, so lower temperatures will signal also melatonin production. So cooling down your body and like glycine does it, some cold shower can lower your body temperature. Sleeping in a cool bedroom will uh, help with melatonin production from a circadian side because what your body should have lower body temperature at night. And there are studies that high body temperature and high bedroom temperature decreases sleep quality. Of course, there are some individuals who have a different threshold for that, but generally you don't want to be sleeping you know, super sweaty and uh, in a super hot uh, bedroom. A slightly cooler uh, environment tends to be more optimal for melatonin and uh, deep sleep, especially. Yeah, studies finding that uh, the most people, if, if the temperatures are lower, then people get more sleep, total sleep time, and they wake up around the same time, but you know, the the total sleep time, total sleep length is generally a bit higher if you sleep in a cooler environment compared to like 38 degrees Celsius or 40 degrees Celsius. What is the best temperature for sleep? Uh, according to the National Sleep Foundation, it's somewhere between 60 to 67 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 to 19 degrees Celsius, which is quite cold uh, But for a lot of people. But I would say that, yeah, you have to find out what uh, what's the sweet spot uh, for you, maybe 22, 25. Um, is uh, the room temperature. This describes the room temperature, 15 to 19 degrees Celsius, not your body temperature. And uh, this describes the body temperature, um, so to say. Uh, if you want to cool down your bed, then you can use, you know, obviously you can just open your window, which is easy. You can turn off the central heating, uh, but there's also like these chili pads, which I use only during the summer. Uh, when it's super hot and you can't like turn off the sun uh, you can only use something that cools you down and the chili pad is a good uh, easy use for that let's talk about exercise how does exercise affect your sleep quality uh, when you are let's say during the daytime you're awake then what happens is that your sleep pressure increases and sleep pressure describes yeah just the desire to fall asleep and the demand for sleep the more longer you stay awake you stay awake for 30 hours then your sleep pressure is super high uh, whereas if you've been awake for only four hours then your sleep pressure is low so the longer you stay awake the higher the sleep pressure is and things that increase the sleep pressure are things like exercise and just you know physical activity mental thinking those can just increase the sleep pressure and the more you exercise the more you want to sleep and the more you need sleep as well if you stay awake you don't go to a bed then yeah obviously the sleep pressure continues climbing and that's going to be bad for your overall health and you get injured or something. But if you go to sleep and uh, fall asleep, then the sleep pressure drops uh, back to baseline. After you've uh, woken up, it begins to uh, rise again. So you want 
to accumulate some amount of sleep pressure during the daytime and you build the sleep pressure with exercise and you build it with also daylight exposure sunlight exposure increases the sleep pressure because of the circadian rhythm uh, clock system and there is studies finding that uh, exercise increases sleep quality almost in a linear fashion so people who are vigorous exercisers they report uh, much higher sleep quality compared to those who are moderate or light exercises and um, yeah obviously it can be like you know overtraining will probably eventually reduce your sleep quality and may cause like insomnia or something restfulness uh, restlessness uh, but still most people aren't exercising that hard and uh, vigorous exercise is still associated with the best uh, sleep quality because of the sleep uh, pressure and uh, other things as well that with the circadian rhythm side help to uh, fall asleep and no exercise is where people actually report some, somewhat uh, worse sleep quality uh, because yeah obviously they don't have that much sleep pressure and uh, their, sleep, their let's say maybe their melatonin production is lower because of the circadian clock system is damaged they don't have that much NAD e exercise also boosts NAD e. so uh, yeah you just want to exercise <laughs> to uh, increase your sleep pressure and improve uh, sleep quality when is the best time to exercise? Uh, cortisol rises 6 to 7 a.m., peaks 9 a.m. I personally don't like to exercise first thing in the morning, uh, although it's fine to do it. Uh, it can also be a good way to kickstart the circadian rhythm or if a jet lag during a new time zone, exercising in the morning can be a great way to start the circadian system at that point. Uh, ideally, the best time to exercise is some, you know, would be between 2 to 4 to 5 p.m. because that's where you have best coordination and the greatest the muscle strength and uh, power but obviously any time is better than nothing uh, so i personally like to work out 4 to 5 pm uh, but you know, any time during the daytime is going to be uh, generally good the high blood pressure comes at 6 to 7 pm so that's where i wouldn't necessarily work out and melatonin production also begins at 9 to 10 pm so I wouldn't exercise. Um, if you exercise too close to bedtime then that can keep you up and that can disrupt the circadian uh, system uh, so I would stop exercising like at least three to four, five hours before bed. Now I'll just you know, cover a few small things that can also affect the sleep in a positive way. Uh, infrared light, infrared saunas, as well as the regular red light. Uh, those have been found to improve sleep quality and uh, melatonin production as well because the red light mimics the sunset to a certain extent, at least the wavelengths. Uh, there are studies finding that it improves sleep quality. Uh, there's also PMF or like impulse magnetic field therapy those kind of things they have also been used to uh, treat insomnia and help with uh, sleep what they do mostly is just reduce inflammation and re reduce pain that can be beneficial for the sleep cycle there's also things like meditation and mindfulness uh, those have been found to improve sleep quality maybe like stress management I would imagine is the mechanism there white noise so some kind of background noise is good for just creating this uh, buffer against the environmental noise so if you have a lot of outside noise then that can uh, prevent you from falling asleep whereas some sort of white noise machine will block it so you hear only like this very monotonous white noise that kind of shields you from the outside noise that will otherwise keep you up and uh, lastly i think yeah like just sleeping in darkness is probably the most crucial thing that you wouldn't have some sort of artificial lights somewhere you don't have uh, lamps you wouldn't have the like uh, window open with the street lamps or passing cars suppressing your melatonin you don't, you don't want that you want to sleep in this se semi complete darkness uh, with as much you know darkness as possible if you want to know uh, more about how do you fully optimize your sleep then yeah you can check out my total sleep optimization video course talks more about overall sleep uh, science as well as how we can optimize it not only just deep sleep etc but that this video just you know gives a good basic overview and uh, good uh, tips for just improving your sleep uh, quality especially a uh, deep sleep all right that's it for this video make sure you click a like subscribe notification bell as well my name is Seeb stay optimized stay empowered